epicardial and endocardial mapping percutaneously to understand the disease process, but also help, uh, hopefully, in the uh, control of the arrhythmia for these patients. So, like I said, in many institutions, you might consider lines or uh, going after ganglionic plexi or in, in folks that believe in rotors and firm ablation. Um, but, or you could argue that this guy's had four ablations, she should go to a true surgical maze, and, and that's not an unreasonable uh, consideration. Because this was uh, the first time he'd been seen in our institution, uh, we offered him one uh, uh, ablation. Uh, we're not proponents of multiple ablations on our end. If we fail uh, more than about twice, we usually will refer to the surgeons. In this case, uh, though, we thought uh, it might be best to, to consider uh, mapping the endocardium as well as the endocardium. And we know, obviously, the at atrial structures are relatively, you know, compared to the ventricle where we think, oh, well, we can't ablate transmurally with, uh, in VT. Um, in AFib, we always assume it's a relatively thin-walled structure and we should be able to make transmural lesions, and oftentimes we can, but that's not always the case. Um, our initial interest in, in epicardial access for AFib dates back to about 2007, 2008 when we did it in this paper by my partner, Dr. Bush, looking at uh, esophageal protection. Um, and that has been shown uh, for, uh, by numerous centers. Um, and, you know, we've always been a little bit um, conservative with posterior wall ablation. Um, certainly people like Dr. Natali uh, ablate with higher powers in the posterior wall, obviously moving very quickly. Uh, we've been always a little resident, uh, resistant to high powers in the posterior wall, um, and partly in, uh, from seeing a few of these uh, esophageal fistulas show up on our doorstep. We've had two that I know of that were from our institution, but we've had a number transferred in from other institutions that our surgeons have uh, had to deal with. This is actually a case series that we recently uh, presented showing uh, the surgical techniques to deal with these acute, uh, acutely presenting esophageal fistulas. So in the original description of uh, esophageal protection, uh, we used uh, a, per a peripheral balloon uh, in the pericardial space to protect the posterior wall uh, or the esophagus from ablation on the posterior wall. And in some cases, we've done this in the past where we've been failed to provide full PVI uh, because of uh, rising temperatures in the esophagus, and we've brought them back specifically for esophageal protection. And here's a couple images of that. People have obviously used uh, balloons and other techniques uh, for phrenic nerve uh, protection as well um, in VT. Um, but we believe that getting more information uh, of the posterior wall, which is, uh, I think, an important target in these resistant cases, uh, as shown by, uh, nicely by Dr. Natali's case today with aggressive posterior wall ablation, can help us better understand if there's regions that we're missing um, for full transmural lesions. And this shows the nice anatomy from a Kalpin's atlas. Uh, of that oblique sinus and how we can access the region of the posterior wall. So our technique is largely the same as described by Dr. Sosa and Skenovaca for VT and which we use today. Um, you can see in the left image the, the needle, percutaneous needle uh, in a sub xiphoid approach. Uh, we typically use a posterior approach uh, for access. Uh, the image on the right shows after we've gotten access doing a pericardiogram to show nice free fluid movement in the pericardium to ensure that we haven't uh, gotten into a, a cardiac structure prior to putting in the long, larger sheath. Once we did this, we can then map uh, the posterior, the left atrium as we typically would with a double transeptal access, a uh, circular mapping catheter and an ablation catheter. Um, our technique is typically to use the agilis sheath for the ablation catheter and a non steerable sheath for the circular mapping catheter. In this case, we've then placed percutaneously uh, a two, uh, closely spaced duodec, which is our go-to catheter for VT mapping, uh, both endocardial and epicardially, into the oblique sinus directly across from the endocardial catheters.
in this case, despite four ablations, we, we ensured the first step is always PV isolation. So um, the, uh, we did full uh, PV isolation and ensured that we have an exit block from all the veins. This is, this is just an example of that. Um, pacing around the circular mapping catheter to ensure no uh, capture. And then we had some nice electrograms. Uh, at the top of the screen, you have the, uh, the circular mapping catheters, in this case still showing some electrical activity in the posterior wall. And then directly across from that, you have the epicardial mapping catheter, uh, again, showing some nice uh, epicardial signals on the posterior wall. And here's another example of that with diminishing endocardial signals, we still have very prominent epicardial signals. Thank you. And I think this image here nicely shows an example from uh, our case series, which is now uh, somewhere in the 10 to 12 range, uh, that when you look at the endocardial map, had you only had endocardial uh, points, you would say the posterior wall is completely uh, isolated and no significant uh, signals are seen, uh, yet when you look on the epicardial side, you can see clear in the top right, you can see clear areas of uh, continued uh, normal voltage. In this case, uh, we then put in the pericardial balloon for protection of the esophagus, and ablation here was still endocardial, uh, but we were able to by more aggressive endocardial ablation with the pericardial balloon protection, then remap and show that, that those areas of uh, survivor myocardium were now scarred and that we had completely um, isolated the posterior wall. In addition, in this case, we did renal denervation. Um, we have used this technique for VT and been part of a couple small case series. Uh, using it for VT, but uh, numerous centers have used it in combination with PVI for AFib. Dr. Steinberg and his group have, have done a number of these. Uh, we have, we, we've done this selectively in patients that have had refractory hypertension in addition to their difficult to control AFib um, using a standard uh, irrigated tip ablation catheter um, and uh, Navix or CARTO mapping of the uh, pulmonary, I mean, of the renal arteries. Endpoints are difficult with renal uh, denervation. This is from one of my VT cases, but uh, you can do high frequency stimulation uh, and see a blood pressure rise prior to ablation and then repeat that high frequency stim and hopefully see no blood pressure rise as a surrogate for uh, a successful uh, RF, though obviously that has numerous limitations. Um, in this case, um, with the combination of uh, epicardial and endocardial mapping as well as renal denervation, uh, we're now about eight months out. Uh, we do not have a link in place, so obviously all um, monitoring with AFib is limited, but we do three, six, and uh, nine, and 12-month monitors for all of our two-week monitors for all of our AFib patients, and to, to date, this patient has been AFib-free. Thank you. <laughs>